Good morning, family. I see all my favorite people are here. God is in his heaven. The sun is out. It's a beautiful day. So let's go right into the word. Let's just get started. You know, when I was growing up, I was told and it was preached that God saw everything. The way the preachers preached, I thought God was looking for me to do something wrong. Like God was just waiting on me to mess up. But now that I understand grace, I know that God is watching me because he wants to help me. The Bible says that he is an ever-present help in my time of need. And being a pastor for nearly two decades now, I found that most brokenness is people thinking that God is keeping track of their rights or wrongs. That God is sitting somewhere just waiting for them to do something wrong, to count it against them um, so that they won't have something. And that's where a lot of brokenness comes from. Because it also comes from the way people act in church. Church folk can act like the sin sheriffs, the conviction cops, and sometimes they even become the fashion police. Just constantly checking to make sure uh, that you aren't going to go to hell because of your hymn line. But when we examine the Bible, we find that God doesn't look for all that. Not at all. Uh, when we look early in the Bible and we look at Adam and Eve, um, we see that the real first sin wasn't what we think it was. It wasn't about any fruit. Um, it's not about what they did, but what they saw, how they saw God, how they saw themselves. But healing will come for us when we really see ourselves the way God sees us, when we really understand God's perspective on us. You see, brokenness is about sight, not so much sin. You might find after we study this today that God is more concerned with our perspective than he is with giving us a punishment. Our text for today comes from Genesis 2, starting at the 19th verse. And it reads this way from the King James Version. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And th therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked and the man and his wife and were not ashamed. You know, I noticed something when I look at God's beginning with Adam and especially with Adam and Eve. I noticed that there are no commandments, not at the start. In the beginning, God simply wants them to make a choice. He wants them to choose grace and love. He wants them to choose what he provided for them over what they thought they could do, over judgment and over ego. And that's it. God just says, hang out and chill with me. That's how God wanted it. Just a relationship of connection, a relationship, not rules, connection, not consequences. God just wanted man and woman to exist in his rest, to exist in his glory, and he would just provide for them. And we also see that early on in this relationship, like a good relationship, God cared about man's opinion. In verse 19, we see it says, and out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever he called them, that was their name. And so what we see here is that God brought things to Adam. Adam didn't have to go seek and search for anything. He just brought it to him. And furthermore, if we look at it closely, God brought Adam what he loved. These were the creatures he had made. These were some of his best creations. And he brought them and offered them to Adam because he wanted to see what Adam would call them. You see, God wants to share with you what he loves. That's actually part of your purpose, is sharing with God what he loves, blessing what God loves. But God brings you things that's part of your purpose 
so that he can see what you're going to call it. Well, why? Again, God valued Adam's perspective. Even though God knew every atom of these creatures, God was the one who formed them and created them. God wants to see through your eyes. God wants to see if you can see him in these things. God didn't need to do that, but he enjoyed it. It reminds me of when you play on the floor with a little child and you get down. Even though you're much bigger and you have much more power, you get down on your knees. And there's something about it that we just enjoy. It's just a precious child. And it's just, it feels so great to be a part of their world. On the floor, playing with the toys, listening to them ramble on, even though you can't make out anything that they're saying. And they're not advanced enough to understand you. But you love being down there with those babies. And here's the other thing. You don't judge. Even though they're making a mess and they're just being silly, you don't judge. You love spending time with them. And there's nothing more precious than when they wrap those little fingers around your, around your hand. When they, when, they, when they put their hand in your hands, there's something in it that just makes you feel so good. That's how God sees us. He wants to be there with us. He wants to be a part of our experience. He wants to see the world through our limited eyes because we are so precious to him. And you know, I guess it must be like when you're parenting and your kids get older and they become teenagers and they don't want to spend any more time with you. And that's how we get sometimes as people. We get so grown. We know so much. We got everything so figured out that we don't want to spend time with God. We don't want to put our hands in his hands. But God cares about how we see things. You see, you're not healed if you think something you did makes God not want to spend time with you. And that's the real reason a lot of times we stop wanting to hang out with the Lord because we think, well, I did this and God probably don't want anything to do with me. You're his precious child. And even though you might feel in a low place, he'll get right down on the floor to meet you where you are. The other thing that God wanted to see was what would Adam name these animals? How did Adam see what God had created? Did he see God in the things that God brought? Or did he see something else? You see, you can understand what a person thinks of you by how they treat your blessings. How do they treat the things that are important to you tells you a lot about how they feel about you. How does somebody keep your house when they come stay with you? There's an old saying that, uh, that house guests and fish both stink after three days. How do they act? Do they keep things clean? Do they put things where they, they're supposed to be? Do they treat what you have let them use your house the way you treat your house? How do they treat your car when they, when they borrow it? Do they, got, do they got bottles all over the place? Is the floor, is the mat dirty? Do they bother to, or even put some gas back in it? You can tell if they, if they value what you value. But even more so, what do they do with the time that you spend with them? Do you get their attention or do they look at their phone? Are they constantly rushing from here to there? Or is it just enough for them to be in your presence? And even larger than that, what do they do with the dreams that you share with them? Do they look at you and tell you you're silly? Do they act like um, you're a fool and you're never going to get what you say God is going to give to you? Or do they cherish your dreams to the point that they're the main cheerleader for your dreams and your dreams kind of become their dreams? You can tell how somebody feels about you by what they do with your, with the, with your blessings. And so that's how Jesus feels. That's how God feels. Forget commandments. It wasn't about commandments. He wanted to know, what do you do with my blessings that I gave you? What do you do with what I gave you without you even asking? What do you do with the thing that I brought to you, meaning that it is precious to me? That's what God wants to see. The names we give things also tells about us. You see, if you don't love yourself, you can't appreciate when love is given to you. When we're not good at our jobs, we hate them. When we can't afford our cars, we hate them too. We mistreat our spouse when we feel like we don't deserve them. And we even reject God when we think that Christ's love was wasted on us. See, sometimes the way we treat things is an extension of how we feel about ourselves. When we don't feel worthy enough. But God says you're his child. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. He didn't make any mistake by waking you up this morning. It was all on purpose for a purpose. Brokenness makes us blind to the love of God and the love of ourselves. But notice, God brings all these things before Adam. 
and God didn't change any of the names. Whatever, whatever Adam called it, that's what it was. Because Adam had authority, and God respected that authority. Adam had the authority to call the things in his life whatever he saw them as, even if it meant he ignored God. And we're going to see that here in a minute. Because something was happening in the garden, and it wasn't good. So in verse 20, it says, Adam named everything, but gave nothing to the, person, to the purpose of helping him. He was naming all these things. God was watching, but none of the things did he connect with. None of the things did he attach to. And men have that problem today. We want to own stuff. We want to control stuff. We want to be in charge of everything. But we refuse to get help when we need it. Adam was here doing the job, trying to handle everything, but he didn't designate anything to help himself. He didn't select for himself somebody to talk to, to say to, I am broken. Men, we sometimes refuse to lay down our egos. And so God does to us what he did to Adam. He put him to sleep. And this happens to men way too often when we're too proud to ask for help. And God has to allow us to be laid down. We get things like high blood pressure, heart disease, layoff, divorce, depression. We have to have some things taken from us. We have to find out how to rest when we won't ask for help and seek the help we need. So sometimes we have to be laid down and helpless. The question is, what does God do when he puts Adam to sleep? When Adam won't name his help, he takes something from him. I need you to hear that. When Adam won't say that I need help, he won't admit that things are overwhelming him. He won't admit that he's drowning in his issues and his depression. God puts him to sleep and then he takes something from him. He takes his rib from him. Now, this rib that he takes from him is a rib that would cover organs. That rib taken from him makes him exposed to some, in some ways. It makes him vulnerable. It makes him more subject to injury. But sometimes God has to show us that he is God and we are human. He has to show us that we're not invincible, though we're wonderfully made. We are not perfect, and he didn't intend for us to be perfect. Men have to understand that healing requires being vulnerable. You see, there's no, re no reward for denying depression. There's no prize for being in pain the longest. There's no award for holding anger over things that you can't change. Brothers, your purpose means too much to God for him to allow you to be stressed, burned out, and discouraged. So Adam sleeps, and God takes a rib, and he makes Eve. But God doesn't bring Eve until Adam is humbled and resting in God. There's a message there. Women, I know you love a confident man, but only a humble man can build a home. An arrogant man becomes abusive when he finds out that God is bigger than him. So Adam is humbled, and that's when God brings him what he needs. And too often, that's what has to happen to us men. We have to be down on our face to understand when we have the love of a good woman in our lives. It doesn't have to be that way. When you realize you need help, when you realize you're not Superman, when you realize that the world is not in the palm of your hand and you know that you need help, say, help me, Holy Spirit. Ask God to send you what you need before you have to be laid down. But in verse 22, it says something very interesting. It says, that God brought her to the man. Do you see that? Two big things are happening in that little phrase. The first thing is, we understand that God spends time with her alone while Adam is asleep. God presents her to the one that's purpose for her. God presents her, not Gucci, not Fendi, not Coach, not Michael Kors. He doesn't give her an injection or an implant or even an extension. God himself prepares her while this man is asleep. All she needs is purpose and her God. That's all that a woman needs for a man to see that she is worthy, to see that she is from God, of God. All you have to do is spend time with God. Because we don't know if Adam slept for 20 minutes or, tw or two years or 20 years, but for whatever amount of time, God did not bring her until she was ready and until Adam was ready, God wanted time to prepare Eve. Notice this too. Adam was made of the dust. The Bible says he was formed in the dust. 
but Eve was made in paradise. Now pay close attention. Man was shaped like clay through hard times and stubbornness. Sometimes God has to shape us. Sometimes he has to take that dust. He has to take it and mold it, put his hands on us so that we come into the shape that we're supposed to be in. It's not a pretty process. It doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't feel good all the time. Sometimes it's embarrassing and humbling, but God shapes man. And Eve was made from Adam's rib, but she was born in Eden. She can handle hard times too. She's got some of Adam's dust from him, but she also flourishes in peace. She is not brought to Adam until he is finally resting and is at peace. If a man's got chaos going on in his life, if he's, if he's, if he's constantly in some kind of drama, if he's constantly um, um, at, at odds with his own emotions, he's not ready. A man at peace lets things come. He don't chase. He doesn't chase a dollar, he doesn't chase a woman, and he doesn't have to chase his purpose. Notice that Adam spent time alone with God and his purpose too. Adam spent all those days working in purpose before he met Eve, before Eve was brought to him. So fellas, if you're looking for that right one, get into your purpose, connect with God, and rest. Get the help you need. So you see, broken relationships happen when we leave God out of them. I'll show you what I mean. In verse 23, it shows that Adam calls her bone of his bone and flesh of my flesh. He gives her a name similar to his own. He's impressed with what he sees, but look at what he doesn't see. In enjoying his blessing, he says nothing about God. He didn't name her after God. He named her after himself. This is the biggest moment in his life. God has brought him his help, but he names her not to honor God, but to honor himself. The light of God is all around Eve because God shows up in the form of light. And so when Eve emerges, there's this light around her. It is the light and the presence of God. And when Adam sees her, all he does is think about himself. He says, she was taken from me, uh, but Adam, who made her? Who took the rib and formed her? Remember, God is watching to see what he names things. Adam only sees how she is connected to him, not God. We all make that mistake with relationships. See, we got to understand, God didn't create her for Adam. God created her himself to help Adam serve him, to serve God's purposes, and to be a helpmeet to meet the needs and the purpose that God created Adam for. Eve was created to help Adam meet the needs of God, not for Adam to boost his ego, not for Adam to have a servant, not for Adam to have a trophy on his arm to impress his friends, not for the needs of Adam's flesh, but so that the purposes of God would be met. You see, marriages are broken when we think our spouse was created to serve our needs. Eve had a purpose, and Adam saw a possession. Remember, God is watching, but he isn't going to interfere because he's honoring man's authority. But there is a consequence. Adam says, she is my flesh. Now, there's two kinds of flesh. There's flesh, which is the body, the organs, the skin, the blood. And then there's the flesh, as in the emotional part of the soul. The part that acts on its own desires without the spirit. In the Greek, this word is sarx the part of us that doesn't know its divine purpose, the part of us that doesn't know what God created it for, the part of us that separates from God. That's what flesh is, and Adam calls her his flesh. Adam is, is admitting, because I see what satisfies myself, I have trouble seeing God when I look at her. That's why Moses, the writer of Genesis, goes off script in the next verse. In verse 24, it's like when you're watching a TV show and then the person looks into the camera because they're trying to explain something and he looks into the camera. He looks into scripture. This scripture stands out. This scripture isn't part of the storytelling. And he says this. He says, that's why a man leaves his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Moses says this because man is so drawn to the woman, he's going to leave everything, including his family, to have her. And I'm sure we have all seen that, but that's not what this sermon's about, but we've probably seen that kind of situation. Now, when we talk about marriage, we love the scripture. 
I've heard it preached a lot. I've preached it myself. Two people become one flesh. I've preached it over and over again. But there are a couple of things wrong with that. Why would God command us to honor our mother and father if we're supposed to leave them? And why would God tell us all to become one in Christ if we're supposed to disconnect from our family? Isn't the family part of the body of Christ too? When the Bible says, therefore, it's not a command, it's a consequence. Wouldn't God want to bring families together instead of breaking them up? Two people coming together to do God's will is great, but when two families join together to praise God, it's an amazing thing, and an amazing thing can happen. It's not easy, but when two people come together in love, it should heal them and everything around them, including be part of the healing for their families. Another point about two becoming one is that it isn't true. I have performed about 20 weddings and never have I officiated a marriage of just two people coming together. People forget that the preacher isn't joining two, he's joining three. The husband, the wife, and God. Two don't become one, three become one at that altar. And it's also interesting that this is the only time church folk use the word flesh as a good thing. God's intention was not that they become joined together in one flesh, but in one purpose. But Adam couldn't see that because all that he could see when Eve was brought to him was what he wanted. Eve had her own relationship with God. Remember, she spent time with God before she was brought to Adam. She had her own abilities, her own gifts, and her own talents. But if you see a person as a possession, you don't pay attention to them, even when they are eating fruit from a forbidden tree. But there was something good that came of all of this. The next verse says, they were naked and unashamed. How could they be exposed and not be ashamed? Because they were in the presence of God. When you are in the presence of God's love, you don't have to hide because love covers a multitude of sins and shortcomings. The love of God causes people to focus on his favor and not on your flaws, to feel his peace and not their problems. Just look at the cross. The writers don't say it, but Jesus was crucified naked. They wanted to shame him. They wanted people to turn away and not look at him. But when I think about my Jesus and all he's done for me, I don't see shame. My soul cries out hallelujah. I don't see shame. I see my salvation. He is not embarrassed. He's my everything. He means I don't have to hide. I can scream hallelujah. It means that Jesus is everything and there is no shame for me when I walk in him. That's all I got. Won't you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we give you praise and we thank you that we can stand unashamed because we are covered in your love. We can understand that, God, you brought us all together to be in your purpose. You brought us all together, not that we would become flesh and lean on our own desires, but we would desire you and you would provide everything that we need. But God, what I love about it is even when we make mistakes, even when we choose ourselves over you, your grace still covers us. Even when we sin, the word says that your grace abounds and pours over onto us. So there may be somebody who's made some mistakes and they think that it disqualifies them, but God help them to understand they can be vulnerable and not be ashamed when it comes to being in your presence. They can say, I've made some mistakes. They can say, I've stumbled. They can say that I have flaws. And you still desire to meet them where they are. You still value their perspective. And you'll hear them hear about all their hurts, hear about all their pains, and still cover them in your love. And begin a healing God that helps them to see themselves as you see them, as fearfully and wonderfully made, as head and not the tail, as having authority and not a slave. So God, I would now that if somebody can pray that prayer, knowing that all have sinned and come short of the glory, if they can understand that Christ came, died, was buried, but rose up, for the sake of loving us. If they can receive that in their heart, they are now saved. And God, that you have a purpose for them. And Heavenly Father, make greater works a place where people can be received as they are, where the way they see the world is value, where 
they understand that we all must come together. Friends and family must all come together, seeking after you, after your purpose, and you'll make us whole. Oh God, I just thank you. When I, when I see the way you provide for us, even in our mistakes, it makes me love you so, but God, when we look at your word and how you have always been present, even in our mistakes, we understand that you love us even more. God, it's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, we got a lot.